Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim. Uh, I study as an undergrad in King Fahd University in Saudi. And for the last couple of months, I was doing an internship in another university in Saudi called KAUST, King Abdullah University. And I'm going to present the work I did back then, which is about a quantum well in, um, with spin orbit coupling. So first of all, I'm going to talk about um, spintronics, the field that uh, this work belongs to. And then I'm going to describe the motivation behind this work, along with the experimental setup. Then I'm going to go over the mathematical formalism and eventually describe some of the interesting results that we got. So spintronics could be considered as a subfield of condensed matter, which looks at phenomena and properties of material that arises from electron spin. Um, it's a really multidisciplinary uh, field because you would have then material scientists trying to fabricate those materials. You would have physicists trying to figure out how spin waves propagate or the way um, or why a, um, electrons would have certain configuration given um, a certain environment. You'd have engineers trying to figure out how to use those materials for certain application or whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, sure. Are you, uh, so one thing that isn't, I haven't heard a talk of spintronics in a while. So one thing that I don't really understand is what, because they've been doing spintronics since I was in grad school. So what, what is it that they hope they're going to be able to do with spintronics that they can't do right now with electronics? So I'm going to get that like in okay. a minute. Cool. Although I'm, I'm not going too deep into that. Yeah. Even Right. Um, so that's why is is considered as like the fastest growing area of research um, for that. So eventually, a typical system that would be encountered in spintronics is in which you have different materials, each having, each enforcing a different orientation of spins. When you connect those together, you are able to manipulate the spin of the system as a whole, and eventually that opens up the possibility of many applications like logic gates, um, magnetic memories, and other applications as well. So then the question would be, why would you go through all this hazard of playing with spins if you can just use like a, the electronics of um, electrical currents? I mean, why go to electronics that are based on sp spin mechanisms? Well, the point is that um, one basic thing is that all the magnetic properties are based on spins. And a magnet would stuck in your refrigerator for like 10 or 15 years, so it doesn't need a constant source of energy. That's a very crude way of describing certain applications in which you can just um, process memories without having a constant source of energy. Um, but yeah, um, there are certain advantages of using, of replacing those special types of electronics. Um, and using those that are based on spin mechanisms that have different advantages on those special devices. Um, so that's about um, spintronics. So there's this group of experimentalists working in a French company named Spintic. They had the setup in which they would have a ferromagnet sandwiched between two oxides. What they would do with this um, configuration is that they would send in a spin current and then they will measure how much they get out after throwing through them, uh, the configuration. And then they would increase the thickness of the top layer. And what you would expect is that as you increase that top layer, you would have less of the um, current that you started with. That's the intuitive thing you would expect. But the answer they got is a parabolic behavior, which is kind of weird. So what they did is they contacted my advisor <coughs> who's a theoretician that they had collaboration with, and they asked for help like, to explain that. So in, in short, they had this setup which had re weird results, and they wanted to explain. So we used. Is, is it like, should be intuitive to us that increasing well, the behavior? Well, the, the thing is that, so you are sending in a like, bunch of spins, right? And what that oxide does is that you have this oxygen which like to get like two electrons, right? So you're eventually getting more of those spins in. So you'd expect that as you, as you increase that thickness of that top layer, you'd have less 
spin current going over. But at a certain point, it then increases, um, which is kind of weird. So w to model that system, we use the simplest model you could think of, which is a quantum well. So eventually, if this is the um, layer of materials, and say the z-axis is the one uh, perpendicular to them, as you move from one point to the other on the z-axis, you would encounter different materials. And that is uh, represented as different potentials on the quantum well. So then up will be the z-axis. Um, so if you then looked at the schematic, you would see that moving on the z-axis would change the potential from in between the well to the barriers. But for any certain point on the z-axis, the value of the potential would be constant for the y-axis. That's why we call that a free variable, and the same goes for the x-axis. Um, if you just looked at the z-axis, you would um, retrieve the very um, typical diagram that you would have in any book introducing the quantum world. So, and then the approach to solve a quantum world is very straightforward. You start with the Schrodinger equation. The Hamiltonian you would have for x and y would be pretty straightforward. It's just the kinetic energy term, since the potential is constant everywhere. And therefore, the wave function would be exponential. But the real deal is with the z um, axis. And then you could categorize the uh, Hamiltonian into three um, terms. Um, a basic one that has to do with the kinetic energy and the barrier. And then another term that has to do with the magnetization. So remember I was talking about the material in between being a ferromagnet. So what a ferromagnet does is that it associates different energies with different spins. So there is that splitting due to different spins. And that sigma is the Pauli matrix for different spins. And then there is a term uh, that arises because of spin-orbit coupling. So these are the three terms. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about uh, that potential rising from spin-orbit coupling. So um, an electron in an atom, an, an electron revolving around the nucleus would feel an electrical field. And then if you were to move to the electron reference frame, the electron would now see an electrical and magnetic field due to Lorentz transformation. Which basically means that now the electron is standing still, and it's the nucleus that revolves around it. So a moving electrical charge will generate a magnetic field. Now that magnetic field cannot push the electron, because the electron is just standing still. But it can change the electron spin. So it can tilt it. So what, if you go back to then to the original frame, you see that there is this relation between the orbit of the electron and its spin. The very classical analog is the idea that on your bike, if you want to turn right or left, you'd have to tilt in a certain way to do that. So again, you see this relation between the spin and the orbit you're taking. Um, so there's that. And then quantum mechanically, that spin-orbit coupling is represented by L dot S. And in order to know how that quantity is affecting your Hamiltonian is by projecting it into the wave function. So in the case of the hydrogen atom, the, the wave function is simply the, those nicely symmetric spherical harmonics. And eventually, the potential you get are just, just a small correction. But in the case of a material, you would have block states. So basically, those are that's, that relation describe how um, the wave function on different periods relates to each other. It's through that exponential factor. So that's where that momentum um, variable comes in. So you would see, you'd kind of see why that potential has a momentum in it as well. Um, now, since we know more about this orbit coupling, we can go back and see that actually in here I have uh, a Dirac delta function. So. For, for the, the type of system that we are considering, the only relevant spin-orbit coupling is at the interface between the materials. There are diff certain, materials, certain materials that you would have to consider spin-orbit coupling throughout the bulk, but that's not what we are considering, so the relevant term is only throughout um, the interfaces.
Um, so going back to the quantum well, so what we do now, we just write the wave function in different regions. So in the left, you'd have an exponential because at minus infinity, the wave function must go to zero um, because of normalization. And the same goes for the right side. And then in between, because of the barrier height, you'd have a sinusoidal wave function. Now what you do is basically you impose the continuity of psi. And then there is a discontinuity of deep psi, and that is due to the fact that there is a Dirac delta function on the Hamiltonian. And there you see the um, spin orbit coupling kicking in. So what that would do is the following. So if you oh, start, yeah. hold on a second. I'm a little lost. So a, there's a, what's a z? So a z is a unit vector through the z axis. Okay. And so it's saying, okay, so it's saying that the part of the k vector that's perpendicular to the z axis dotted with dotted the span. Right. So that's like a phenomenological. Um, so this almost looks like some sort of. Uh, so it's a continuity and a discontinuity. Of deep side due to the Dirac delta function, which has the uh, spin orbit coupling. So eventually, if you were to look at the equations then, without the spin orbit coupling, you would see that the spin up and down are decoupled. You'd could, could write the eigenstates as just spin up or either just spin down. But due to spin orbit coupling, you would see this mixing. So eventually now your eigenstates, your eigenstates are not spin up or down, rather they are tilted. So eventually now your eigenstate, you could be written as, um, I mean, you refer to them as spin plus and minus. And they are mainly either spin up on the, or down, and then a contribution from that spin orbit coupling. So that function g, you would um, intuitively know that as that spin orbit coupling would be very small, that g function would also be very small. Um, so that's how you would is expect the wave function to look like due to introducing the spin orbit coupling. So that's um, the, um, the spin orbit coupling, the, the like parameter. The parameter. Exactly, like how strong the coupling is. Okay, but the first term depends on z, and only the second term depends on. on so, like, I'm saying that if 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 the spin orbit coupling is really small, essentially the plus spin state is mostly uh, an up state. Okay. And then there's the tilting due to. I see. You're right. It's like a perturbation. Exactly. On, on, you start off with up, and then you turn on the spin orbit coupling, and you have a little bit of. Right. And the FZ would have the block vectors in it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you were to apply certain approximations, you would be able to, f to write down the wave function explicitly. Uh, but it's kind of ugly. <laughs> uh, so bear with me for a minute. So essentially, I was talking about an up spin st uh, a plus spin state. So you'd see here a factor that has to do with the, that is multiplied by uh, the upspin state. So that is basically what you would get for a finite quantum well. And then there's this garbage that is multiplied by the opposite spin. So that is due to, um, that's the perturbation due to spin orbit coupling. Um, so this slide wasn't supposed like to get anything from it, it's just to see how these I mean, simple problems could end up with like very long equations. And then essentially that's one complication, because if you th thought about it for a second, it's just a quantum well, essentially, right? If you start dig deep into it, you'd find how like hard to solve these equations are, and then you'd end up with a quantization rule that would require some magical numerical techniques to like solve it for different parameters. Um, so there is that. Now, the quantities that we are interested in are transport phenomena. And the states that contribute to those are those at the Fermi level. But there isn't only one state at the Fermi level, because you have a part of the wave function from the z-axis, another one on the x and y. So although the total energy is that of the Fermi energy, but you, distrib you could distribute them 
on either x and y by different amounts, and then eventually you have many states that represent the Fermi lemma. So these two parts are um, the z part of the wave function. And you could see here what looks like uh, a first state, and here what looks like um, a third excited state. But they are both combined with their x and y counterpart to, exa to be, have exactly the same energy. Um, but essentially, the point here is to see that the dotted black line represent the unperturbed psi. So that's without any spin orbit coupling. And then as you introduce the spin orbit coupling, you'd have moved that state into a plus spin state, which perturbs psi a little bit. And it does different perturbation depending if you are either spin up or down. Where's the, well, where are the boundaries on this axis? Um, so that would be around, like here, in which you see the exponential part going. And then there's the sinus. Zero, so it goes from zero to one. Yeah. And the same for the other side. Yeah, so that's um, 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 the magnitude of psi square. Um, so now for the result. So what I did is writing that mathematical code that would solve um, given certain barrier heights, a certain splitting, and a Fermi energy, would give you all the possible um, spin states, and then would calculate those spin densities and other quantities that we wanted to know about. Um, so in here, I would have three regions, um, a lighter one and two darker ones, which represent the quantum wood. Um, and then I'm looking at the um, y part of the spin. So remember I was talking about the spin orbit coupling tilting the spin. So if that component was the z uh, axis, the one for magnetization, the other component would be due to spin orbit coupling. So that's the other component. So I'm fixing all the parameters, the barrier height, um, the spin orbit coupling at the right interface. So that's there, and I'm only changing the left spin orbit coupling. So you'd see that as you increase that value of alpha L, you'd have um, a greater increase in the spin density. And then what's interesting is that if you increase it to a greater value, um, you would have what we call an insulating effect. So basically, as you increase the value of the spin orbit coupling, you are tilting the spin more and more. But at a certain point, if you in increase the value of that spin orbit coupling to a very high value, essentially the potential that you're introducing at the Hamilton is so great that now you're starting to insulate that interface. So now no electron can pass through that um, part of the material to the other side. So essentially in here, in that left side, it's just zero because no electron can pass this by anymore. And if you move from this side, you see that it starts getting like lower and lower until there is nothing on the left interface. Um, so there is that. And then also what you could look at is the um, total value of the spin density. So I'm summing over all the spin density over all space for the different regions. And then what you could see first is a, a linear region. So as you increase the value of spin orbit coupling, you would have a linear response to the tilt. And then suddenly you see a big drop. So that is due to the following. So the equation that determines the number of states is the quantization rule. And in there you would find the uh, spin orbit coupling. So changing its value would change how many states you have. So essentially, in this linear region, you'd have 11 possible states for these values of the parameters. And then once you cross that point, you lose one state. So you have this big loss of um, contribution to the total spin density. So in this whole region, you have 11 states, and then suddenly you have just um, 10 states. Uh, to analyze the figure even more, we, what we could do is separate those states that have positive contribution and those that have negative contribution. So the blue is the one that have positive contribution. And you see that only you'd see only a drop on the plus contribution because you're losing one state. Um, so there is that drop. And again, you see a linear region and then an unlinear one. And that is due to that insulating factor I was talking about. 
Um, so essentially, this parabolic behavior, the red line, is what we would expect as the experimental result that they were getting. There are other things that you could look at, like changing now um, the width of the barrier. Because as you increase the width, you allow more states. So you could see what you could have. But I guess I already took too much time. Um, you could know what I have so far. You could also look at the different spin density in free space, what, would, what could happen. If you change now um, the barrier height, um, some has interesting features. So in conclusion, I started with the experimental setup um, and the result that we wanted to get on and the model that was the symbol um, quantum well. And then eventually the result that could somehow ma uh, give us a qualitative understanding of what's going on on that um, experimental setup, along with other features of the quantum world. Um, just a quick acknowledgement to the professor I worked with, along with other students who helped me with the LaTeX file, some numerical issues, and that's it. So if you have any question, please don't ask. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, that was my presentation. Any questions? I mean, uh, the first plot where it shows the parabola, can you just tell me what the units on the y-axis are again? It's like H, F over J, uh, and then it was just uh -huh. familiar to me. There. Yeah, so in here, that's the effective uh, uh, H field. So that's one way to look at the spin current, because eventually, this, I mean, that amount of spin current would create that magnetic field. But you cannot really know how much spin current you have, but you could measure their effective magnetic field. So it's normalized to the current, though, I guess? Yeah. Okay. And then in here, the thickness of the x axis, the thickness of that layer. So, um, they're connecting. So they're connecting these that configuration they have with vacuum, and then getting that magnetic field from there, like measuring it. I guess I may just understand. Like when you have that uh, three-layer device. So what they have in. So what they have even like before and after is just vacuum, and they try to measure it from there. So after passing through the whole configuration. Okay. What does the company want this, this device for? Like, what are, how are they going to try to make money? So th the thing is that um, the reason why they ha we're trying this configuration is that there was this paper on Nature trying to see these effects on this type of sandwiching, right? So they tried it some and have that weird effect. Like, n not everyone like doing these experiments in that company is like mostly toward like devices. Others are like doing kind of paper stuff. Um, it's like more of an experimentalist group. So you, um, you were talking with spin orbits and coupling. Uh -huh. um, are there any effects that come into coupling with nuclear spin? Uh, does the material have uh, nuclear spin? Um, I don't think I have any idea of that. Uh -huh. Looking at that, you get, you get splitting the spin orbit of that sand, and you get hyperfine splitting. Right. It's not like a lot of perspective to the nuclear spin. So it's one there for the nuclear spin. That's it. So what are the injective currents in this area, and what are they measuring against the water? The effective magnetic field, the H field. So, like, the thing that, so that, that so they're sending in a spin current, right? You could think of it as just electrons, like of spin up, right? So eventually those would align and create a magnetic field. 
So that's what they measure eventually, is how much those spin current are creating uh, of that edge field. Do they measure it at a particular location? They do, right? Yeah. So they have a very localized magnetic field sensor? Right. Uh -huh. Along with that direction. Right. Where is the periodicity of the potential? Why do you use So I, I was mentioning that because of the way of um, the reason why that potential that arises from spin orbit coupling. So, you, so in, a, in a material, I was saying that spin orbit coupling is essentially L dot S, right? And to get the potential, you would project that into the wave function. So that is not due to the quantum well. That's in any material that is not right. hydrogen. We have that form of spin, of potential that arises from the spin orbit coupling. And we had that imposed on the quantum well to represent those materials, if that makes any sense. I see. So if you have removed the, the two oxides and just treat it as a you don't have a quantum Well, so I was mentioning two kinds of spin orbit coupling, either the one on the bulk or the interface. So this one is purely th for the interface. So if you remove the two materials, you don't have that anymore. So, um, so you had to put in something into your Hamiltonian to force the spin, up, spin orbit coupling to happen at the interface. Um, so the quantum well by itself does not have that, right? So that's why you introduce those terms in the Hamiltonian. But I thought that you would get spin orbit, my intuition is that you would get spin orbit coupling at the interface just by the continuity equations. And that itself would create spin orbit coupling at the interface. Because the different spins will have different continuity equations. And then eventually they will be decoupled, right? You'd, you'd, you'd be able to write your eigenstate as either spin up or down. That's why they are eigenstates. Because in optics, you get a spin orbit coupling at any faces. Uh -huh. And you don't have any actual spin orbit coupling. It's just due to the continuity equation of the interface. That's why I wonder if the same thing happens here. Or here's another way of looking at it. Um, well, at least in optics, right, this is the way that one way to look at it, is that at an interface, when you come into an interface at an angle, you have the boundary conditions for the interface. And if you think back to electromagnetism, you divide the electric fields at the interface into the P and S polarizations. And those are linear polarizations, the one that goes into the interface and the one that goes along the interface. But now if you think in terms of, and those two, those two linear polarizations will be independent, as you said. They'll stay independent. Uh -huh. um, but they can get um, different reflection coefficients, different phases at the interface. And so the, if you then think in terms of spins, which are the circular polarizations, right? So that what that means is that right-hand circular is of, up and, uh, of H and B, mm -hmm. or S and P, let's say, S and P. And if you change the phase between S and P, then you can turn right-hand circular into left-hand circular. Right? So it means that there's a coupling now between the two, oh, I see. two circular positions, just due to the boundary conditions of the interface. So maybe that maybe the boundary conditions work differently in this case, so you don't have to work it doesn't come out that way. But uh, I, wonder, I wonder if you would get the spin orbit coupling but isn't that those spin orbit coming was a boundary condition? Because it's only imposed on the boundaries because of that delta function. But you, but you, right, but you impose it with a Hamiltonian. Right. Whereas in this case, there's no Hamiltonian that imposes it. It's just you literally have one Hamiltonian for your, for your top space, one Hamiltonian for your bottom space, just like you typically do in, in car mechanics. Mm -hmm. And then it's just the spin orbit coupling comes about by doing the continuity of the wave function and so on across. I see. Um, anyway, just thought. <laughs>
<laughs> don't take a lot of offense for yeah. Okay, oh. more questions? Yeah, um, I have a question regarding the, the alpha bonds. What does it mean to have a positive or negative alpha bond in the last blocks that you showed? For example, yeah. no, uh, that one. Uh -huh. So basically, that would refer to um, this figure. So you could either set up your um, spin orbit coupling either to like have a plus, um, like you could either tilt the spin either this or that way, right? Depending on the value of that spin orbit coupling. So that would be be it. Uh -huh. in the, one of the last blocks where you were floating on the x-axis alpha r. Right. So how is alpha r related to the thickness of the top layer? Right. So, he, so here's the thing. So increasing the thickness of the material would over-oxidize the oxide. So that means you are kind of injecting more oxygen into that material, which effectively increases the spin-orbit coupling, the, like, I mean, roughly speaking. Um, so, yeah. Okay, we better stop. We're going to need to uh, still need to do the summary part of it. Thank you very much for your time.